Hello, my name is Craig Roberts and I'm a senior lecturer in the Surveying and Geodesy teaching the four-year Bachelor of Engineering Surveying program at the University of New South Wales. I've recently been working with folks from the New South Wales Education Department uh, to develop an iSTEM curriculum entitled Surveying and Geospatial Engineering, SAGE. So we're offering a 25-hour module to teachers to deliver to their Stage 5 classes, so Year 9s and 10s, in one term. The curriculum can be found at a link which we're going to put at the end of this uh, YouTube video. We recognise that teachers may know very little about what it is that surveyors do, but we think it's fun and interesting and contains a lot of elements that include maths and science, geography and engineering studies. So we want to encourage teachers to consider delivering this module to their class and have provided numerous links and resources to assist teachers in that curriculum. The sort of students who will likely be interested in surveying and geospatial engineering are going to enjoy maths, especially geometry. Um, they'll like the outdoors, probably well, they definitely will like maps and gadgets. So we've tried to design a curriculum that contains all of these elements. I'd like to give you an example now of uh, an example exercise that you could run in your class and it's especially suited to circumstances where you've planned a class, you're gonna go outside and it turns out that it's raining or it's very, very hot. So let's get started. First thing you need is a blow up globe. The bigger the better. And you need tape measure, something like this, which is kind of a bit floppy. Uh, you need another little box tape like this, which is handy. Um, it's good if you've got a whiteboard or something like that. So if you're in a classroom, you'll probably have one anyway. And a little toy like this, it's always fun, like a little spaceship or something, okay? And the students are gonna to wanna to have their calculators and they're gonna have some sort of access to the internet, yeah? So that could be on their phones, I don't know what your phone policy is at your school, or on a computer. So we need the kids to be able to look up things on the internet. So you can start off with things like, where's the equator? Yeah, they're all obviously gonna to point to the equators around here. And then you can say, well, where's the poles? And here's the poles. But of course, if you move the poles, then you move the equator. So now suddenly they start to see the geographical rules that govern the way that we describe things on the surface of the earth. For that, we use things like latitude and longitude. This is confusing for some students, which way is longitude and which way is latitude. So you can ask questions like, what is the latitude of the equator? Might take a little while to realize it's zero degrees, but then you might realize, well, if you come up 10 degrees or down 10 degrees, how do you know if you're in the South or the North Hemisphere? So of course we have the negative sign for the Southern Hemisphere. So a mathematical description. Hmm. We can also talk about longitude, yeah? And there we look at the poles and we can say, well, there's 360 degrees in a circle and 360 degrees of longitude. But longitude relates to time. So as the Earth rotates, over 24 hours, every hour the Earth moves 15 degrees. So these sorts of concepts can be quite interesting for, for students. You could even talk about gravity if you wanted to, depending on how long your class is and how engaged the students are. So you could say things like, you know, the gravity at the equator is less than the gravity at the poles. And that, of course, is because the Earth is rotating. So it's not only the attraction of the mass of the Earth, but it's also the fact that the centrifugal force is throwing students out, yeah? But of course, at the poles, that's not the case. And then, actually, the Earth isn't a sphere. It is an ellipsoid, so it's a little bit flattened at the poles, so you are a little bit closer to the attractor. So that could be of interest. You could also even talk about 3D coordinate systems. So when we talk about longitude, you might ask the students, well, where's zero? Where's the zero longitude? And 
it might take a little while for them to realise that it actually goes through the Greenwich Meridian. And you might ask why? Well, it's just a convention. So from there we have our zero degrees of longitude and that's how we talk about Greenwich Mean Time and things like that. But we could also, rather than just describe the Earth with latitude and longitude, we could also talk about a Cartesian coordinate system. So in maths, you would have talked about your XY coordinate system. Well, with the Earth, we also do the same thing. And this is now we're talking about geodesy, the study of the shape and gravity field of the Earth. And the GPS system uses Cartesian coordinate systems. Imagine a right-handed system where X goes from the centre of the mass of the Earth, I can't get into it, the X goes along the Greenwich Meridian, the Z goes through the spin axis of the Earth, and the Y completes the system. This is how GPS works, and the coordinate system rotates with the Earth. Yeah? Hmm. So, some interesting extra things that you could talk about. Ask the students if they could work out how to compute the radius of this globe without popping it. Let them think about it for a little while. There's a mathematical solution, and I hope you're all screaming at the camera saying, of course, Craig, it's C equals 2 pi r. So, when a student tells you the little formula, C equals 2 pi r, you could write it on the board, and that's where you produce your little tape measure, and you ask them, can you please work out the circumference of the, the globe? Yeah, and this is where they're going to then have to try and line it up, and it's quite fun. Stand back, let the kids have fun. Try and measure around the equator, or they could measure one of the meridians of longitude, and they run all the way around uh, trying to measure that circumference. Okay, so once they've done that, I've previously worked it out, and it is about 1.83 metres. Yeah? So now they have to do a little calculation and work out with their calculators, what is the radius? And when they do the calculations correctly, they'll work out that the radius is about 29 centimetres or 0.29 metres. So you can check me on this. And of course, it depends on the size of your globe. And I hope you can see that it's helpful to have the bigger the globe, the better. Okay, so now we know the radius of the globe and we haven't popped it. We could check it. Surveyors often check things. We could check, oh yeah, 29 centimetres, yeah, that looks about right. Hmm. Now you ask the students, well, what actually is the radius of the Earth? And at this point, they might not be too sure, so this is an opportunity to, get to then check the internet and find out what the radius of the Earth is. And I'll tell you what it is. Um, radius Earth equals uh, six, three, seven, eight kilometers. So this is where we need to be careful with units. So for fun, you could just leave kilometers. And now you ask the students, could you compute the scale factor between this globe and the actual Earth? Yeah, and let them do some calculations. Now, they'll do a number of calculations and I've pre calced this. And the scale factor should be a number that looks something like this. 0 0.0000000456667. 0 0 0 0 Quite a long number and lots of zeros. This is challenging because the students need to be careful of units, which is a, an important mathematical concept. If they mix up metres and kilometres or centimetres and millimetres or whatever, they'll get the wrong answer and the wrong number of zeros. So you might like to do a few pre-calculations beforehand to make sure they get it right. Once they have that scale factor, now you can start introducing some fun. Ask the students, have you ever uh, heard of the International Space Station? And of course they will have. Then it's how high is the International Space Station in altitude above the surface of the Earth? When they, and Again, I've looked this up, the International Space Station, it's about 408 kilometres, yeah? And you can get that easily off the internet. Once they have that, then you apply the scale factor and you find 
that it turns out to be about 1.8 centimetres at scale. And this is where the fun begins. This is when you then get your little tape measure, measure out your 1.8 centimetres and get your little spaceship, measure 1.8 centimetres and try and place it at scale on your globe. The students suddenly realise how close that space station is to Earth. It's very visual, it's very powerful. Hmm. Making whooshing noising noises is also pretty fun at this point. You know, kids love that. Now we're going to start talking about the sort of things that we do in surveying and geospatial engineering. Introduce the idea of remote sensing satellites. So the Sentinel missions from the European Space Agency are very modern and there's a range of them. Ask the students to look up the Sentinel satellite and ask again, what's the altitude? And what you'll find is that for Sentinel, it is around 800 kilometres. Apply the scale factor and they should get about 3.6 centimetres. Yeah? And again, you can do whoops, the same trick. The same trick with the device. And then you ask yourself, 3.6 centimetres, why is it so close? These are the sort of questions that you can ask. Why is it so close? What's the purpose of this? And if you look up the information about the space, uh, the Sentinel missions, you'll realise that there's uh, imagery on these devices and they want to be close so that they can get some coverage but also some higher resolution. Hmm. So there's a concept that they can think of. Okay, the next uh, satellite mission we want to talk about is GPS. Most Kids will have a smartphone and they'll have GPS in their phone. How high do the satellites orbit around the Earth? The answer is 20,200 kilometres. Now, if they apply a scale factor to that, I think we find that 92 centimetres is the distance off the surface of the Earth. So if we measure out 92 centimetres, suddenly we see it's quite a long distance, way out here, yeah? And you might ask yourself, well, why are the satellites flying so high? Why are the GPS satellites so high? And the answer is, so they have more coverage. We can have less satellites to cover the whole Earth for positioning, yeah? So this is not about imagery, they're just sending radio signals that we use for positioning. And I believe part of the surveying and geospatial engineering module talks about how GPS works in a fairly basic sense. Yeah? So it's good to link these things together. Okay, the last sort of orbits that we can look at are geostationary orbits. Now, most students will have heard of geostationary orbits, certainly my experience. So geostationary are at 36,000 kilometres, which is quite a unique altitude. And that equates to, with our scale factor, which again, you ask your students to compute, 1.64 metres. Now, I won't be able to fit that um, here, but you could imagine measuring out 1.64 metres and having a little uh, satellite out here. And at this point, ask a few students to get involved. Measure the distance, uh, have one student with the satellite and have another one holding the Earth. And as you rotate the Earth, the satellite should stay in over the same spot. That's the point of these orbits, yeah? So it's a very unique altitude. This is very important for communications. So if you're watching a sporting event from overseas, live via satellite, it's coming from geostationary satellites. But geostationary satellites are also good for remote sensing for weather prediction. So they can see uh, quite a large portion of the Earth and see the changing, swirling patterns of the, of the clouds and the like. So geostationary orbits are also really important. As some extension work, if you still have time with the students, you might want to talk about uh, when we were talking about the remote sensing satellites at 800 kilometres, you might want to talk about polar orbits, that is orbits which orbit around the pole or even slightly retrograde and in a so-called sun synchronous orbit. And the idea of a sun synchronous orbit is that the satellites are always pointing at the sun so that they're always charging their solar panels, which means 
that the instruments on board the satellite can be more power hungry and they can do more, more functionality, but also that the Earth is always illuminated. So another interesting little task for some of the students if they're interested in that sort of thing. So in summary, what we've talked about is some different orbits that relate to surveying and geospatial engineering. We've had geostationary orbits that we use for communications, remote sensing weather. We have MEO orbits, medium Earth orbits, at around 20,000 kilometres for positioning, for GPS positioning, which surveyors really use a lot. We've got uh, remote sensing orbits, low Earth orbits, LEOs, at around 800 kilometres, which we use more for imagery because we're interested in resolution. By the way, the highest resolution you can possibly get from the Sentinel mission is around 25 centimetre pixels at the moment. So we won't be reading newspapers over anyone's shoulder in a cafe anytime soon. So this is the exercise that you could run. I think it can, you can do it comfortably in 40 minutes in a class. It's the sort of thing that you can fit into um, the Surveying and Geospatial Engineer Engineering iSTEM module, but it's also the sort of thing that a maths or a science teacher could teach just as a one-off as well. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you have fun with it. And I really, really encourage uh, STEM teachers to please um, have a go at our, at our Surveying and Geospatial Engineering iSTEM module. If after about week seven or so, we're going to put a link at the bottom of the, the, this video where you can, if you're a New South Wales teacher, you can contact a local surveyor who could actually come to your school and they could bring their equipment and show your students some of the equipment. Um, and they can even offer some students some work experience, year 10 students some work experience in surveying. So we're really keen in encouraging um, young students to, to learn a little bit more about our profession and maybe consider studying at a university. Thanks very much for your time watching this and I hope you found it useful.